Okay, let's start. Um, so uh, I'm going to be loitering in the background here, making sure I hope that nothing goes uh, technologically wrong. Um, do my best. Um, we have uh, today a presentation from Kathy Sanger, whom you all know as our uh, newsletter editor, webmaster, membership secretary, but also our resident not mad scientist uh, who has been busy in her lab all year uh, and more than a year working on her ergonomic flutes. So Kathy will tell us what she has been up to. Um, if you have not already muted your uh, sound at your mic, if you would do that, then I don't have to play hall monitor. Uh, and uh, if you have any comments, put them in the chat, please. And uh, Kathy will answer them later in the session. Okay, so um, I'm going to be talking about um, some new directions and ergonomic head joints. <clears throat> and they'll be mostly ones that I made, but I'm giving you a background also. And in this photo, um, you can see some computer generated um, ergonomic flutes. And you can also see a real one that I'm holding. <clears throat> um, OK. So here's my outline. Um, first, I'll tell you a little bit about my um, interests and background in flute research. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about uh, what's an ergonomic head joint, in case there's anybody here who doesn't know what they are. Um, I'll talk about what's out there already in ergonomic head joints, um, designs past and present, and past designs go back many years. Um, some hardware options for holding the flute and additional work resources you can go to if you want more information. And then I'll talk about um, my own head joints, which are, I, I gave them a, a temporary name called articulated tees. Um, I hope to come up with a better name than that, um, but that's, that's the working name for now. <laughs> I'll talk about um, the motivation, what got me started, um, the goals and scope of this project, my basic design and why I like it, and um, some of my favorite configurations from really um, literally infinite possibilities. And then I'll talk about factors that affect playability and intonation and harmonicity. And I'll have a little break for questions, but the real important thing for a lot of people is, you know, they might be comfortable, but they have to sound good. And so I have a bunch of um, demos I've made of the uh, various ones, and you can kind of pick which ones you want to hear. Uh, I will play them through just so you get a feeling of things. Uh, what I'm not going to be talking about during this presentation um, is like a step-by-step -step guide to fabrication um, and the measurements and simulations that I've been using for optimization. Um, and I'm very hopeful that this uh, work will be in a paper pretty soon. And I'm also not going to talk about my future plans for collaboration or commercialization because I haven't really figured that out yet. Um, okay, so about me, I'm a longtime avocational flutist and now retired IBM scientist and inventor. And um, some of my past flute related projects. Um, this is this acoustic knife edge is actually one of my favorite inventions, though it's not patented. And put a little piece of scotch tape on your armature hole and uh, can often make the flute sound better. I've also done quite a bit of work in artificial blowers. And I've um, shown this at a few flute fairs uh, where you can take a pump and a uh, um, garden hose and a few other things and you can replace the person playing with the flute with um, kind of just the air stream. And it's kind of an interesting teaching tool. And I've also um, developed some new techniques for measurements and modeling. And that was actually published about a year ago in a reputable journal. So I'm very pleased with that. But anyway, today I'll be talking about new directions, pun intended, um, in ergonomic head joints. OK, so what's an ergonomic head joint? Um, it's a head joint that allows the flute to be played in a more comfortable position. And the concept is shape the flute to fit the player rather than making the player adapt to a one size fits all flute, risking comfort and discomfort and injury. And ergonomic head joints are typically used by children with short arms and older adults with musculoskeletal disorders, which can be temporary or permanent. Um, and although I like to see this change, like ergonomic head joints are not much used by professionals um, these days. Okay, so what's out there already? I think I mentioned that some 
of these ergonomic designs have been out for a long time. So the three oldest in this composite um, are um, this one, this one, and this one. This one, um, these two are end-blown flutes, um, and they're vertical. Um, and this one is, okay, the oldest, and, uh, okay, and these are, okay, so I call them vertical flutes because the flute is coming um, out of the embouchure hole area um, vertically. Whereas this one is a transverse flute because um, the flute comes out of the side of where you blow. Okay. Um, this one is from like the 1850s um, and it's a path um, flute. And this one is um, a Gunther flute. And this one is a Georgi flute. And this one has like a modern day counterpart and that's the Wesley flute. And Chip Shelton likes to play that. Um, and um, then we have bent head joints. Oh, okay. And this one is a modern day um, head joint from Martin Visser, which is basically the same shape as this flute here. Okay. I just clicked too much. Okay. Um, and then you have um, kind of gently bent head joints. Um, this one was made by Albert Cooper. And this one is a Martin Visser head joint. And now it's time for Malcolm to show his head joint because he bought one. Okay. Can you see his head joint? Um, okay, I can see it. <laughs> um, okay, and then there's um, the recurved head joint that a lot of kids use. Um, okay, and uh, Sanford Drellinger uh, makes a head joint that looks a lot like this one. Um, okay, so, um, so I showed you the head joints um, that are ergonomic that are out there already. And I also want to show you something about the support hardware. and. I would say that that's a component of this whole endeavor that's underappreciated. Um, okay, so um, Sanford Drellinger, well, everybody needs like a left-hand support and a right-hand support. Um, and the more vertical the flute is, the more you need the supports. So um, here's a right hand. You need something to hold your right thumb in place and you need something for your left hands. Okay. Um, and um, here, these are Martin Visser's offerings. And you can see the right thumb in this one here. And here's another way to look at it. Um, and I think my photos here are probably bigger than uh, Malcolm's photos of these. He held up the flute. I, I think that these are fine ones I have here. Um, and he has like a left-hand support. And here you can see him playing a vertical flute and the left-hand support and the right-hand support. Um, Okay, and so if you want more information about these ergonomic head joints, um, okay, the National Flute Association has a website, uh, a web page devoted to uh, the Performance Healthcare Committee. And on that page at the very bottom, you can find an article by Chip Shelton. Um, and it's a summary of a 1918, sorry, 2018 NFA convention presentation um, that might be of interest to people. Martin Visser has a very nice website. There's a nice article called Reshaping the Flute on the website. He also has an online guide to buying adaptive musical instruments. And um, from his videos, he seemed like a very nice um, personal person. And we also have Chip Shelton, who's giving a talk, I think, um, uh, at four o'clock. Um, and you can see him here with a Wes his Wesley head joint. Um, and he's a, a frequent flute fair presenter, and he's uh, NFA a performance healthcare committee member. And um, he presented at last year's food fair and a video of his presentation called Playing Without Pain Pre um, Prevention and Management um, can be found on his website. And it's very nice. I enjoyed watching it. Okay, so uh, the motivation for me getting started in making ergonomic head joints is that New York Food Club member Malcolm Spector needed an ergonomic head joint. And uh, in August 2000, 19, he bought one and he let me try it. So thank you, Malcolm. <laughs> um, and so, but my impression was that the tone quality was kind of uninspiring. I didn't like the intonation and I thought maybe I could do better. And um, by this time I had a, a few capabilities that made me think I could do it at all. Um, I had to, I looked, a nice basement shop that had a micro lathe and a mini milling machine. Um, those are actually, uh, technical terms, um, but anyway, I had those two tools that were very useful. And I uh, had taken some community college courses in CAD and 3D printing and machining, so I actually learned, I know how to use those tools. And 
I've also developed some new techniques for measuring and modeling the flute's passive resonances, which um, really equipped me in uh, optimizing these, the intonation of these flutes. And this is a supplement to a long-standing interest in flute head joint acoustics, and also some early 1980s experience making flute head joints with parts that I ordered from the Emerson Food Company. And Shirley Pompoir here, uh, actually in the early 1980s, tried some of those flutes. And it was a very helpful and a fun time. Um, I'm the proud owner of a Kathy Sanger original head joint. <laughs> yeah, but I don't remember which number you ended up with, maybe 10 or 16 or something, but yeah. Um, so anyway, so the, the goal from this project um, was to make a head joint that would be um, used with a conventional bone flute that offered a range of comfortable playing positions and had great sound quality and playing characteristics. So who wouldn't want a head joint like that, right? Um, and so my design approach was to do it with a modular construction with interchangeable parts. Now, doing it this way has a number of advantages um, because the effect of single components can be isolated. So it's easier to optimize things if you can just change one thing at a time. There's also no need to restart from the very beginning if one of the parts that you made um, gets screwed up. Okay, so it's kind of easier manufacturability. And I also wanted to maximize um, maximize the use of off-the-shelf components. And we see a typo right here. Huh? Okay. So, so basically, I kind of succeeded in doing all of this. Um, although the tone quality, um, it's, it's probably not the, the first choice for top-tier professional flutists. Um, I gotta say that sound quality is kind of closer to good than great. But then again, it could be the player that's responsible for that, not the head joint itself. Um, okay. So the basic design is I take a T that you could get from your local hardware store. It's PVC, polyvinyl chloride. Um, here's, and I uh, put an armature hole in it. Um, and here's a cross section of the T with it's pretty neat computer graphics. Um, and you can see a cross section of it, okay. And so you have this T and then you have a modular jointed neck that connects the T to the flute and you have Lots of options for joints. Um, you can get a straight one, um, 22 degree elbow, 45 degree elbow, or you can put two 45 degree elbows together. Um, okay. And, um, okay, so one of the reasons I like this design of having it be T based is that the same T can be played in two configurations, but it's a little bit of work to switch. Okay, you can have it in the transverse. Uh, configuration, which is kind of conventional. In that case, you have the flute coming out the side here, and you stopper one arm of the T and the base of the T. Or you can have it be an end uh, blown configuration where you stop, you stopper up the two um, ends of the T, and then you have the flute coming out the bottom. And um, these two um, possibilities combined with this modular jointed neck allows a huge range of positions. And so now we're gonna take a look at some of this flexibility. Okay, so um, the conventional transverse, this is basically a T head joint uses it in the conventional uh, setup, um, has limited positional flexibility, basically has just one axis of rotation and you can rotate where the red arrow goes. Okay, so, um, okay, you get more positional flexibility um, with the ergonomic T head joints. So I'm gonna show three examples, and this is the first example. It's a transverse T because the flute comes out the side and the, the joint is basically a single 45 degree elbow and it has two axes of rotation. You can rotate the, the T keeping this part uh, fixed or you can rotate the flute um, with respect to the elbow. Okay. Um, the next example is a vertical T um, with a single 45 degree elbow. And it also has two axes of rotation around the, the base of the T and around the axis of the flute. And one of the really neat things about um, this, um, these vertical T's is that you can rotate the T by 180 degrees and you can play it, so you can play it on either side of the armature hole. And so you could even 
have slightly different cuts of the two sides of armature hull, and you get different tone qualities and stuff. So I think that's kind of neat. Um, okay, and the third um, example I wanted to show is a vertical T with a double 45 degree elbow, and you have three axes of rotation. You can rotate the T, you can rotate the two elbows with respect to each other, and you can rotate the flute with respect to the last elbow. And again, the vertical T can be played from either side. Okay, and so here I show just a, a bunch of different uh, vertical T options, and not all of them are ergonomic, some of them are just put in because they're kind of fun, or maybe a little ridiculous. But here's a kind of a standard one. Um, it's angled on the side, it's quite comfortable. This one is forward playing, I'd say not so comfortable. Here's one, vertical T, double elbow. It's kind of similar to a regular flute, but a little lower. Here's a double elbow on a vertical T, forward playing, not so comfortable. And here's, and it um, shows kind of what I think is my favorite for comfort. And um, the transverse T options, um, again, not all of these are ergonomic. This one's just a little bit ergonomic. Um, it's a little lower than a regular flute. Um, and this one is um, pretty good. Um, it's almost as comfortable as the one that I like the best. Um, um, but anyway, the bottom line on ergonomics is that with these uh, head joints, a huge range of positions are available with the modular jointed neck and the odds are one are good that one will be right for you. And the problem that I've run into, which is kind of funny, um, is that you can find with the double elbow, there are so many configurations that you can find a position that you really like. You have to write it down because you could lose it and not get back to it because there's so many ways, there's so, so many, and it's like a Rubik's cube and you can never get back to where you are. So um, keep that in mind if you ever try one of these. Okay, now you can never get... ever take your flute. Right. <laughs> um, so um, next, I'm going to talk a little bit about support hardware. Um, and support hardware becomes more necessary as the flute orientation becomes more vertical. And the normal support points um, when you hold the flute horizontally are um, the base. Uh, okay, well, I don't have a flute in my hand, but um, but the base of the left index finger and the right thumb. And um, good music to test um, how well your flute is balanced. Lots of high Gs are really good for testing how well the balance is, at least I think so. Um, anyway, so I have two, two types of support. Um, so my uh, right thumb support kind of looks like this, another case of lovely computer graphics. Um, and it snaps onto the flute and this um, bottom um, channel for the thumb can be angled any way I want. And I, I mean, I can, depending on how I cut it, I can cut it in any way I want. Um, and the left hand support is just something to rest your um, uh, left bottom index finger against. And these work pretty well and they're light. Um, and that's another thing about the T head joints made out of PVC is that they're pretty light. Okay, so here shows, okay, these are photographs, not computer images. Uh, the left hand support and the right um, thumb support um, snapped onto the flute. Um, here you can see like the left uh, hand support, and this one's a, a, a vertical T double elbow. Uh, that's okay. And here you can see me holding the flute, with the, the two supports. Um, okay. Oh, and then one last thing is that uh, the infrastructure of these um, T's, okay. Okay, the, the, the T's need to have two corks rather than one. And here's, this, this is the cork assembly that I use. Again, I think pretty spiffy computer graphics, but these are all the parts and you um, squeeze, you twist the nut and squeeze them together and it plumps out the O-rings. And um, this is what it looks like and it makes a good seal. Um, okay, so next I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, playing characteristics, okay, because the comfortable playing position is only part of the solution. So how does the head joint sound? Well, what um, you have to worry about is intonation and harmonicity. And intonation is how well the played new notes 
are in tune in absolute terms. Okay, so like, is your A440 or 442 or 430 or 435? And also relative intonation is how the notes are in tune relative to each other. Notes on the scale are in tune relative to each other. And harmonicity <clears throat> is how well um, the upper, the, in, the instrument's upper resonances line up. And that's very important for tone quality. And typically with a flute, because it's a, a, an instrument that's open at both ends, um, the frequency of the nth resonance is approximately an integer multiple of the fundamental. So the nth um, kind of harmonic or resonance is an integer times the fundamental frequency, which is F1. And N would be an integer that goes one, is one, two, three, or four. You know, a clarinet would the integers would be one, three, five, whatever, but flutes, um, they're all there. Okay, so those are the two things that are very important to get right, intonation and harmonicity. And what factors affect those things? Okay, so most people know that um, the position of the cork with respect to the armature hull um, affects the intonation quite a bit. Um, and usually this is 17 millimeters for most everyday uh, bone flutes. And also another factor that affects intonation is you pull out the head joints. Um, and we all, we, know, we all know that. Um, another thing that affects harmonicity and intonation is the shape of the head joint. Okay, so most bone flutes today have um, cylindrical, sorry, um, conical head joints, okay? So here are the conical head joints and some people, some people call them parabolic, but they're really kind of uh, conical, except it doesn't go down to a point on this one. But. So conical, or you could have um, cylindrical head joint, um, or you could have a stepped um, head joint bore. Um, and the T's kind of have um, a stepped bore, I would say, okay. And I mentioned two little known acoustical facts that are relevant to this um, ergonomic head joint construction, which is that um, a tube with a bend in it, or basically, okay, or an elbow, okay, it's not equivalent um, to the same length of the same size tube. It's close, better replaced by a shorter tube that is fatter. Um, that's good to know if you're trying to get the head joints fine tuned. And also, um, something that's good to know is that uh, most good flutes, um, the resonances are not perfectly harmonic. And um, people have learned that it's best if the, sec the second resonance of a fundamental is just a little bit sharp. It helps the flute play better. And um, that's a characteristic that's known as a wide octave. And here I show, this is actually real data, and um, I fit it with a line that matches the real data so well that you can't see it. <laughs> um, but anyway, he, um, this is a medium low C, which is basically practically all the holes open. And here's the first resonance and the second resonance, the third and the fourth. And here you start getting tonal lattice effects and the peaks are all like mess, messed up and small. But um, exactly twice this frequency would show up where this dotted line is, but the actual resonance is um, at a higher frequency than this dotted line. And I guess I forgot to mention that this plots is intensity versus frequency. So, okay, but um, that's the maximum science for this presentation. Um, anyway, so I've talked enough about um, little known facts. Um, and now I'd say it's time for questions and I have about um, a bunch of videos that we can listen to, um, but if people have questions, um, I figure we should break for now and we'll just play videos until the time runs out. So, any questions? Kathy, uh, Gail yeah. asked earlier uh, if you could define passive resonance. Oh, okay. Um, it's it's um, where you get a sound if you just go like, <sighs> you're not playing. You're not playing the flute. You're just, it's just the, the resonance of the instrument by itself without making a sound. So um, there's no um, air jet involved. It's just, so the way I measure 
um, okay, so it's okay, an active resonance is one that's being played. Um, it's kind of a vague term, but um, but it's it's the pitch that you get if you just go you just do like a unfocused airstream. Um, and the way I measure the passive resonance is um, this this is actually a curve of the passive resonance. I put a microphone in the where the cork is in the flute head joint, and I, I, I have this little noise maker that just makes like white noise, which sounds like air rushing out. I don't know if you can hear that. Did you, did you hear anybody? Oh, I guess yeah, you know we can hear. It sounds like. Um, and and that's basically how I get the spectrum. So, um, and if it were um, the played resonances, you would hear see like you know huge spe um, spikes where these re the, the passive resonances are. Um, so I, I don't think I explained it so well, but. Um, that was a good question. Um, Gail, does that answer your question? Is it the is it the 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 natural way that the instrument vibrates? Yes. Without without applying an embouchure or a directed stream of air. Yeah, it's it's the natural resonances of the instrument without having like a a sound in it, which is like a nonlinear sort of thing. But it's it's the natural resonances. That's yeah. Thank um, you. Yeah. Okay, we have a comment from Rie um, that Jupiter makes a head joint for children uh, that you might want to add a photo of, and she has oh, a, oh. a link. Um, yeah, I, I know that one. Yeah. It, it yeah. works for small adults as well as small children, probably. Right. It's kind of U-shaped. It, 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 it I'm not looking down. at it right now. Rie, you want to explain it? Yeah, it's, it, it is a U-shape. You're, you're yeah. right. You're right, Kathy. It's, yeah. I just thought if you're showing difference yeah. of head joints, it might be interesting. Yeah, although that one, I guess I have an excuse for leaving it out. Um, I think you need, a, I think it doesn't fit on a regular flute. I think they have to move the trill keys. Oh, um, that I don't know about. All I know is this is a child's flute. Yeah, child's yeah. Flute. Okay. yeah. but th that's, a, that's a good idea. I, I um, but yeah. Okay, um, and then we have a we have another question from okay. from Sylvain, which says, "What do you use to carve the embouchure in the PVC?" Oh, okay. Um, so I use my milling machine um, to make a hole that's um, ten millimeters by twelve millimeters and has rounded edges. So I use a five sixteenth um, mill a mill to do it, and then I hand, um, I touch up things by hand with a uh, carver, a hand carver. Oh, and this is something that is really very interesting for anybody who wants to make these things. Um, it is so easy to do hand carving of these things after you make the main hole because you have access to it with your carving tool from three sides. You, have, you can access it from the bottom and also from the side. You can't, okay, the normal flute head joint, you can only access from the top. And so that's really something that makes this very nice. Um, although some people, I guess they carve the, the chimney and the lip plate before they put it on the flute and they solder it afterwards. But typically you do the soldering first and then you um, carve the hole. So Kathy, do you add the lip, a lip plate onto this construction? No. No, okay. So, and actually for me, the fun part is making the embouchure hole in the T because it takes about 15 minutes and I can get immediate instant gratification or instant um, disappointment. <laughs> but um, but the, the way to do things is only take off a little material at a time and stop before you went too far. Oh, and I, I guess I can mention that I showed you this invention that I had about putting scotch tape on the embouchure hole to make it sound better. It works. The reason I came up with it is because I I didn't learn the lesson about not cutting too much of the hole away. Um, and so putting the tape on makes it a little smaller. And so I got a lot of head joints that were like duds because I cut them too much to sound pretty good. Um, so that's how I learned how to do that. Um, so, Kathy, how did you decide on the shape of the embouchure hole, which flute makers have been fussing with for centuries? 
Um, I aim for 10 by 12 millimeters. Um, oh, but another very, okay, um, okay, another interesting thing is that there are many manufacturers of um, PVC tees and everybody has different, they're different sizes, they're not the same. And so um, depending on the manufacturer, um, the, the, the riser depth is different and that really has an effect. And it's very interesting. Um, so um, yeah, so it went, so, you know, it's fuzzy, like a, a, you get a deep, dark tone when um, you have a, um, a thick, uh, a thick wall here, and you get like a lighter tone when it's uh, thinner. And so that's that uh, interesting. I have a question. Kathy, can you play one of these? Do you have oh, well, that's the perfect lead, leading question, because that I'm going to play them after everybody's done with the questions. I think there's one more question from Shirley, okay. which is, can it be made out of wood or some other medium, say water metal, uh, to make it more cosmetically presentable? Oh, my husband thought the same thing. He was telling me that um, nobody is going to be interested in these because they look too ridiculous. Um, and uh, so anyway, there's some arguments there, but um, okay. So it would be crazy to make one that was just the same thing except with metal in it because it would be way too heavy. But I think um, I think it would be fine to make them out of wood um, and you know metal that had the same inner shape. But, you know the sound waves don't care so much how thick the walls are as long as they're okay. So yeah, you can make them in other materials, and I think it would be more aesthetically appealing. Uh, yes. Does PVC come in other colors? Yes, it does. It does. Um, I think you can even get it in prints. Uh, so, yeah. Um, but my, right. my mark, I'm, I'm trying to, yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway. Um, All okay. right, we have another question from oh. Jan. Uh, she says, I noticed that the T head joint like the modern flute creates a bump in the tube when inserted into the flute body. Have you experimented with tapering the inside of joints to smooth out the point of connection? And oh. if you have, how does that make a difference in resonance or intonation? Oh, okay. So I think the foil that I have up now, can people see it? I hope. Yeah. Yeah, right. Okay. So so the question is about this the space where the head joint is pulled out. Is that the question? Jan, you want to get on, on the... Mike and yes, 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 that's that's a point. Oh, okay. So I have a really good answer for that one. Um, okay, it's very interesting because I made these head joints. Okay, um, I didn't know exactly how they would be in tune with the different elbows and everything, and so a lot of them are pulled out way more than the normal flute is pulled out. Okay, normally you might pull out like you know two millimeters or something, but some of these were like you know twenty millimeters pulled out, and so the gap, this little tuning gap was much bigger than, was much longer than normal. And it does make a difference in the intonation. So I was trying to test the intonation and I would just um, put in a tube that's like longer. And I, I okay, so anyway, it was, it was a variable that I didn't realize was important. And so in this paper that I wrote that I'm still under revision, um, I talk about how, um, you know, people have these tuning rings that you can put in. I think um, uh, Abel Flute Company makes them. Um, and sometimes you might want them, but sometimes uh, if you take, okay, it can change the intonation. It can definitely change the intonation, the harmonicity, um, this gap if it's big. And I had plenty of times where the gap was very big because it's just how I made these. So did that answer the question? Yes, thank yeah. you. That's okay. very interesting. Um, okay, okay, Kathy, I think that's all the questions in the chat right now. So maybe okay. we'll go to the videos and if people have more questions, we'll come back. Okay. And um, I think I'll probably play all these three and then, okay, oh, so the kind of a survey of the ones I have, I have these three, which are like the transverse single elbow. This is the one I played yesterday, number two. This one is vertical, um, 
vertical T with a, a single elbow. And then I, I put one in for me playing my normal Brannon head joint. Um, and there's this one, and then there's some that are much more vertical, which are geared for people who have shoulder problems. And there's two versions. One is, and, and this last one is like, it's uncomfortable for me, but it's, it's really close into your body. So, but these are like, anyway, so I start with this one and there's a strong preference for some of the others. Um, you can let me know and we'll rearrange things. Okay. So I'm demonstrating um, a transverse T with a single elbow. Um, here's the T and here's the 45 degree elbow and it's transverse because the flute's coming out the side rather than the bottom. So I'll play it now. is very comfortable. Um, it's not my favorite. Um, my favorite is um, a vertical T with a double elbow, um, but I like the high register in this one. So now I'm going to show um, a vertical T with a double elbow. <clears throat> and if we go up close, you can see on the T part and it, um, it's vertical because the flute is coming out the bottom rather than the side. And it's a double elbow. Um, and you can see elbow one and elbow two, and they're both 45 degrees. And now I'll play it a bit. <clears throat> this one for me is the most comfortable position. Um, but the high register is a little uh, resistant. Um.
I'm going to show a vertical T with a single elbow. Here's a close-up look. Um, here's the T. Um, it's vertical, the flute's coming out the bottom, and here's the 45 degree elbow. Now we're going to um, turn around and you can see the flute from different angles. register is a bit resistant, but I really like the middle register. Now I'm going to play my regular head joint um, so you can get a comparison. This orientation is a lot like the regular flute, except it's just a little bit lower. You can see the double elbow here, and um, here's the uh, T part. So now I'll do the rotation.
Um, now I'm going to demonstrate uh, a vertical T with a double elbow um, that's configured to play in a more uh, vertical configuration so you can keep your elbows at your sides. Hi, uh, here's another configuration of a vertical T with a double elbow, two, and it's in a very vertical configuration and my arms feel really scrunched up, but it's a little bit like a saxophone, um, but if you can't move your shoulders, um, it's probably the best uh, position. Kathy, I think we're going to have to put those up on the website and call it a day here so we can get to our next okay. event. And you're the webmaster, so you know exactly what to do to get those links up on the presenter page. Uh, right, but I don't know if they're supposed to be available to everybody, but uh, we'll we'll work on that. Okay. So thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you, Kathy, for a fascinating uh, tour of your lab and its results. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing what they look like in various colors.
Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> of all sorts. Bye. Thanks, everybody.